Welcome to the Global Leadership Podcast. This is my co-host, the one and only executive producer of the entire Global Leadership Summit, Lori Herman. Herman, Herman, Herman. <laughs> and this is my co-host, Jason Jaggard, who is CEO of Novus Global, entrepreneur and longtime fan of the Global yeah, Leadership I Summit. I love it. I love it. I'm coming for years. I'm so glad. And you know what? It happens every year. Mm -hmm. And every year we would like you to come as well. So if you want more information about the summit and the amazing speakers we have lined up, go to globalleadership.org for more information. Yeah, and we've been having a great time here. Yes, we've actually been at the summit special edition mm -hmm. here in Frisco, Texas, and we have taken this opportunity to talk to some of the amazing speakers we've had at this event. That's been awesome. And we've had to interview them and kind of hear the story behind the leader. Yeah. And I just got done talking to Sint Marshall. She is amazing. She is the CEO of the Dallas Mavericks mm -hmm. and she worked for AT&T for like 35 years. She's got an amazing career yeah. and um, just had some great insights. She, this book, I read this book and I was so moved by her story. Mm -hmm. um, she's actually a cancer survivor wow. and um, masterfully wove stories from her whole life and her background, she's had a challenging background and it was just so inspiring to, yeah. to meet her and to hear from her. Um, so anyway, I, yeah. I think you're gonna love. I can't um, wait. Let's check it out. Learning a little more. Yeah. Sint Marshall, it is so great to be with you and have this chance to talk and get a little bit inside your life, kind of the behind the scenes of what we don't always see. Uh, Thank I, you. Thanks for having me. Oh, oh my I'm, goodness. Thanks I'm for having thrilled, me. Thrilled yes. uh, for this opportunity. Uh, for the people that listen to our podcast to get to know you better too. Thank you. Thank um, you. Well, I have been privileged enough to be able to read your book. Ah! Your thank new you. book. Yes, thank you. Was that a real labor of love or was it really an easy thing to do? Well, it started out kind of easy because it basically started out as me just wanting to put my cancer journal out to people because over the years so many people would ask me for it because they, you know, they would hear about it and you know, I tell everything. The good, the bad, the great, and the ugly. And so I said, you know what? If it can be encouraging to people who are touched by cancer, I will put it out there. So it just so happens that a, uh, a publisher, an agent, called me and said, she heard me speak somewhere. And she said, I want to write a book about your life. And I said, well, I don't want to write a book about my life, but I do have this journal that I want to get out. So I actually gave her the journal. I thought it was a masterpiece. It was not. <laughs> And so because she knew some of the stories, yeah. you know, she pitched it. All the publishers came back and said, we want it. So we went through all that. Yeah. And then they said, you know what? You talked a lot about being chosen because that's the title. Of course, you've been chosen. You talked a lot about that, you know, throughout your journal. But we act cancer journal. But we think you've been chosen for a lot of things. Chosen for a lot of things even before you were chosen for cancer. And we want to tell some of those stories, too. And I was adamant about not telling any other stories mm -hmm. except the cancer story until they got this they ghost writer. They must have wore you down. They wore me down. So they <laughs> said, so they said, OK, we're just we're going to have a ghost writer. This lady talked to you. And Beth is wonderful. Every Friday night, just give us a couple of months. We're like, I'm like, OK. So every Friday night for a couple of months during the pandemic, I would spend time with her. And she would just ask me all kind of questions. And then she would come back with the chapter and something that related to the title of the cancer journal entry, but a life story. So for every round of chemo, she wanted to tell a life story and I didn't want it. But I like it. Did you love it? Yes. Ah, well, yes. I loved it. And I think the thing about it were some of those stories. Like not only did the cancer piece of your story have such a huge impact on me, but hearing your life story and all those pieces, get, I feel like I know you already. Oh, yes, <laughs> and, yes. Um, so I would love for you to, if you can summarize for the people who haven't read the book yet, just a little bit of your background, because I can see so much of how you were raised and your youth that has built into who you are. And I think for our audience to hear a little bit about that, could you give us just a little background on your life? See, I love that. That's exactly what they wanted. They're yeah. like, no, people have to know how you got to the point where you could just deal with cancer the way you dealt with it. And it started a long time ago. And so I grew up uh, in poverty. So I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Yeah, in a housing project. Uh, my parents uh, moved there from Birmingham, Alabama, 
where they left when I was a baby because they didn't want us to grow up, uh, you know, with all the stuff going on in the with Jim Crow laws and all that at the time. And so they moved to the Bay Area and we didn't have a lot. Uh, I actually think I had a good childhood, uh, but I had a lot of stuff that happened uh, in my childhood. I mean, my mother was the uh, victim of domestic violence, as were most of her children. Um, my father broke my nose when I was 15 years old, uh, and we had left our house. Uh, we had to flee our house that summer when my parents got a divorce. Um, even four years prior to that, I saw my father uh, shoot a man, actually in self-defense because of all this stuff that was in our neighborhood. But he actually uh, shot him back in defense of me because I was standing at the door when all this commotion broke out. Okay. So, so I say that to say, I've seen some things yeah. and our family experienced some things to us. It was normal kind of stuff. Okay. We just kind of got through it. Uh, my mother put two books in my hand at an early age, a math book in one hand and a Bible in the other, and just basically said, keep your head in these books and you'll get out. And at the time as a kid, I didn't realize what out meant. But it was basically out of poverty and out of the projects. But I had a good childhood. My mother got me involved in all kind of things. Uh, I had these three teachers and a principal who embraced me uh, when I was a junior in high school because, unfortunately, I, I started school that year with a brace on my nose from when my father had broken my nose. And it wasn't normal. And I was head cheerleader and I was out there cheering because my mom told me to go to school. That's what I was supposed to do. Just go and do what I was supposed to do. Uh, she taught us it's not where you live, but how you live. And so that's how I grew up. So even though my zip code was 94804, education mattered, faith mattered. Uh, it did matter what my zip code was. And fortunately, these teachers didn't care about my zip code either. And they found out what was going on in our house. They embraced me and got me involved in all kinds of clubs and activities and knew my mother's dream was for her kids to all go to college and, and just do some big things one day. And the Lord blessed me. These teachers embraced me. I ended up uh, getting five full scholarships to the college of my choice. Wow. When, I mean, even at that young age with that mentoring of those teachers yes. and uh, that faculty at the school, how did you know that you were a leader? Well, they got me involved in things and it was just natural. I mean, it was natural on the one hand, but I'd also prepare. I mean, if there's something they said I would do, if I had to lead a, a meeting, I would just, i prepare. Yeah. And then I didn't have a problem speaking with people and all that. And then I decided I wanted to be uh, the senior class president. And I actually decided that at my, my sister's graduation. So I have uh, two sisters who are the oldest. Yeah. And so they were three years older than me. So I'm a freshman and I'm sitting at their graduation. And I see these two guys on stage, these two white guys on stage. So I look at my mom and I said, can a black girl be up on that stage? And she goes, yeah. I said, so I could do that? I could be the senior class president? And she says, yeah. I said, or the student body president? She says, yeah. I said, okay. And so then when it came time to run as a junior, I went and grabbed one of my buddies, Terry McCray. I said, Terry, I need you to run for student body president and I'm going to run for senior class president because we gotta be up on the stage when we graduate. Now, I wasn't thinking about all the work that we, <laughs> all the work that we had to do to lead our class and lead our school. Uh, and so we both won and very diverse high school, right? So we both won yeah. and had a ball leading our class. And that was probably the point where I really knew I was a leader because we had to bring a lot of different groups together with a lot of different uh, agendas. And we got some things done that year. It was a great, great class at John F. Kennedy High School. Aww. And then when we graduated that night, I was up on the stage. I know when you started working for the Mavs, you weren't necessarily a big, know, know a whole lot about basketball. Right, I was a fan. I mean, so I, I was actually a fan, but I didn't know anything about the business of basketball. Yeah. But my boss promised me that he would teach me the business of basketball and others would too. So don't worry about that. He was looking for a leader and he, and he came good on his promise. I mean, he really did. He has taught me the business of basketball and so many other people I uh, have. And so you just dig in. Yeah. And so you spend time and then you got to figure out, okay, what is this business about? Uh, in fact, I, you know, I'll back up to when I worked for AT&T. Yeah. I remember at one point they were offering, so it's my first job in the company is supervising operators. But then they offered me my boss's job a year and a half later, a promotion. Yeah. And I turned it down. And I turned it down because I wanted to learn more about this big technical company that I was working for. And so I ended up turning it down and took a lateral as a network engineer so I could really learn the company. And I'm still like that. I really want to go deep, even though I don't have to, you know, go deep every day. I, mean, I don't have to actually 
do it all, but I want to know about it. Uh, because first of all, I want to know what the people are dealing with every day. Mm -hmm. um, because just as a leader that serves, I need to be able to serve them. And so I want to know what's happening. And then I'm competitive too. So I want to know how we're, oh yeah. Because <laughs> then I want to know what our other teams doing and what are the rankings and all the different, you know, metrics and all that because I want us to be number one and everything. Yeah. So, yeah. So what does inspire you and get you up and get you motivated? Okay, my kids. Yeah. Okay, my kids. The Lord made my family. I mean, you know the story. I mean, it's in the book. I had four second trimester miscarriages and a daughter who died at six months old mm -hmm. and just prayed, you know, for a family. And the Lord had a way to make my family. You, I didn't. The plan that I had, it just didn't work out. He had a plan. And so now I have these four wonderful, wonderful kids that we adopted, and they all have their own stories. Uh, and one day I hope they all write books and tell their stories. But trust me, I tell enough of their yeah. stories, right? So if you read my book, you'll get yeah, their stories. Yeah. And so I'm inspired by them. Yeah. I'm inspired by their resilience. I'm inspired by my family, uh, my husband, and just how it kind of all came together. And so they keep me going. And they're and they're they're older now. And so now I'm just inspired by kind of helping them, you know, navigate their lives and all that. Uh, and then I'm inspired by making a difference yeah. uh, just by being involved in different, you know, I'm on different boards and nonprofits and all that. I'm actually the chair of the board of Dallas CASA, Court Appointing Special Advocates. And we focus on being a voice for kids uh, in protective services and kids in the foster care system. And so I'm very inspired to make a difference for them, to make sure we're just not serving those kids, but we're saving those kids. So that actually truly does get me up out of bed in the morning. And then I think um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, really? making sure like in the in the industry I'm in and, and I grew up in a male dominated industry in technology mm -hmm. and now in sports is to make sure that women not are just at the table, but they are thriving. And so that was important to me because I didn't see that uh, when I first started in sports. Uh, so I said, OK, I need to help to change this yeah. because, you know, there's just it's just better. When we're all at the table. Yeah. And so we, we, we've been able to uh, make some changes there in very real ways at the Mavs. That's really wonderful. So you've been in your career, really, for 40 plus yes. years now. Yes. Really, years. probably fighting a lot of barriers. Every day. As a woman, Every as day. a black woman. Um, but you haven't been discouraged. Oh. At least, mm. has mm. anything ever gotten you down? Have you ever felt like it's not worth it? No, I never feel like it's mm. not worth it. I mean, sometimes I stop and I'm like, really? Yeah. And because I, I learned a long time ago, and it took me a while to learn it, is I don't have to carry people's baggage. People have a lot of baggage. Yeah. I don't need to carry that. I mean, I'm not a porter. I'm not the yeah. concierge. I don't have to carry your bags. And if you have issues with women, you have issues with people of color, you have issues with whatever, those are your issues. Yeah. And I've decided you get to carry your own bags. And when you want me to carry your bags, meaning you want to put all that on me, I will call it out. I'm just you at that point that. where I will call it out. I will let you know you have baggage and I'm not going to carry it. And the people in my circles and around me and the people who the Lord has blessed me to be uh, kind of to lead, to lead for. Mm -mm, no, we don't carry your bags. So either you can, we can help you unload those bags mm -hmm. and unpack them and figure out what's going on here. Or unfortunately, that you're opting out. If you don't want to put them down, then you're opting out. Uh, so I've kind of gotten real bold later well, in that's life. Good. Well, it's because you know sometimes when you're younger, for different reasons. And so I'm not judging it at all because I've been in those shoes. For different reasons, you can't, you, you won't step up hmm. Bec for a whole lot of reasons. I mean, some very legitimate. Okay, and sometimes there's some things you want to say, but you can't say it or you don't know how to say it or you think, uh, you know, it's going to cost you your job, all of that kind of stuff. And I had that happen to me one time where I actually got a promotion and this woman was basically telling me to change myself. Mm -hmm. And she's giving me all these cosmetic changes and then all this just style changes. But then she also told me to stop using the word blessed and say lucky. Mm -hmm. And I thought, OK, it's getting out of hand now. And so I turned down the promotion. And I told her, I said, you know what, 20 years ago when I first came to this company, y'all told me to take off my red shoes and take my braids down. And I did. But now 20 years later, I know better. I get to do me. Because that has nothing to do with my work performance. Mm -hmm. But I didn't say that, you know, when I was 21. But I said it at 40. Yeah. I said it at 40. 
And now I'm 63. So who knows what I'll say at 63. <laughs> <laughs> You're emboldened, you know. <laughs> and I'm a voice for people. And it's so important to, you know, you can make a choice. You can decide you're going to be a bystander or an upstander, that you're literally going to stand up for somebody. Because as I said, there are a variety of reasons why people can't always stand up for themselves. Sometimes people don't even realize what's being done to them. That's um, so true. But I pray every morning, Lord, let me see it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I want to be the one that sees it so I can help call it out and fix it. Yeah. Not just call it out, but to fix it, to use my platform and my resources to fix it. Obviously, it sounds like maybe a lesson that you learned that you had to take into this challenge of coming into the Mavs at such a challenging yes. time yes. and the scandal that was going on around that. Yes. What was the, the biggest challenge for you when you took on that um, problem? I guess I'm not, it, was, it sounds like a challenge. I keep using the word challenge again. But as you well, moved was, into the was, position with the Mavs, that seemed like yeah. a really challenging situation. It How was did, quite a great opportunity. Uh, so, so first of all, not knowing the business of basketball. Yeah. Because, I, I mean, I like to know the details of what I'm doing. OK. But I had to set my priorities and I had to really focus on what has to happen right now. What, what, what can't I can't drop it. It's like that whole crystal ball rubber ball thing. And that's how I set my priorities at work and at home. Crystal are the things that if you drop them, they shatter, they never come back. Mm -hmm. Rubber balls bounce back or they bounce away because you didn't need them in the first place or they bounce to somebody else and they'll take it and do it for you. Mm -hmm. So what was crystal? And what was crystal for me starting out is to basically purge all misconduct Mm -hmm. and put in um, policies, et cetera, that really uh, promoted a speak up culture and called out misconduct. Okay, so we had to really kind of focus on that. The second big priority was to develop a women's agenda because there weren't any women in permanent leadership positions, executive positions when I got there. Mm. That's crazy. I mean, I just I, I just think that's that's nuts. Because you need everybody at the table to was be successful. Was that a hurdle you had to overcome? Did you had to convince people that that was valuable to have women at the table? Or, well, or for, fortunately, were people being, receptive. Well, for, no, they weren't all receptive. But fortunately, being the CEO, they, I mean, we just needed to make the moves we needed yeah. to make. And so within 90 days, my leadership team went from zero uh, women at the table until, of course, I got there. Um, and zero people of color to 50 percent women and 50 percent people of color. At the executive leadership tables. And then the expectation is that that happens throughout. And not just for the sake of it happening, because it's the right thing to do, but it's the right business move to make. And so we just had to, we had to just deal with it. And so we had to make some changes. You said that one of the things that inspires you are your children. And I know as a working mom, it can be really challenging to show up and be the kind of mother that you want to be yes. uh, and be present for all the things and uh, model uh, the kind of woman you are and want to be uh, as a professional. How did you balance this? And I don't know if you can ever balance being the kind of mom and being the successful professional woman who's using the gifts you were given to the best that of your ability how do you hold those two things and do them both so so well see I love that I love that question because and you said it I don't believe in balance for me yeah I, don't. I just don't because it would suggest at some point in time something's going to get more weight or whatever I believe in integration mm, I just word. bring it all together that's that's my word and so when I need to just you know focus more on something at home or I need to show up to something that my kids are having. Uh, I do my crystal ball, rubber ball thing. Yeah. I mean, I can't show up to everything. Uh, So I just try to make my decisions based on the priorities and I integrate it all. And so people ask me a lot, where do you ever feel guilty when you can't show up to something? Well, I don't. I I don't feel guilty. Yeah. This one time in particular, I was going to take the day off. Because I have these certain days, like I always take the first day of school off, the second day of school off, kind of. Mm-hmm. And sometimes the teachers are That's faked right. out because they think they're going to see me all the time, right? So I take the first and second <laughs> day of school out and the last day of school. Those three days are important to me yeah. for what I need, what I want to do for my children, okay? And so they got into that habit. Well, then I always take Halloween off. 
because it's always some big Halloween party. Yeah. And so the whole family would get all dressed up. So this one particular year, I told my bosses, I said, I'm going to be off on Halloween. Well, they ended up having some big company-wide town hall, and they wanted me to come and speak because, you know, I'm lively and I bring the music and the energetic yeah. presentations. And I said, I got to be off the stage by 10 o'clock. Yeah. Like, I am off the whole family is dressed up. We got our 70s outfit. Like I had all these big Afro wig, the 70s look. And my husband in this big red Afro. I said, we're ready. I mean, I was so proud of our costumes. Well, it ran over. Oh, no. So I jump off stage and I'm looking at the clock. So, and I got to drive like 30 minutes and I get to my son's fourth grade classroom. And of course, I'm not dressed. Hmm. And I'm feeling so bad. And I'm like, okay, uh, what do I do here? Because they're all in there. Everybody's dressed up. My husband, all the other parents, and the kid is waiting for me. What do I do? And so I just had to go in there, no costume or anything. Yeah. My son and his little friends rushed me at the door. My son grabbed my work badge. And he said, look, everybody, my mom's a worker. All the kids are looking at my badge. They want to know how they get one. What do I do? <laughs> my husband is just looking at me because he's over there in his big outfit. <laughs> and the parents, the other parents are all made up. And they're like, you got to be kidding. I had, I mean, I didn't have time to change. It didn't matter to him. Yeah. And the lesson that it taught me is sometimes you just have to show up. Just show up. All that guilt, all that other stuff that we put on ourselves, That's uh, that's we're doing that. Right. The boy said, look, my mommy is a worker. Hmm. What if I didn't walk into that classroom? That would have been the disappointment. Right. So sometimes you just have to show up. And you can get it all done. You might not be able to get it all done in one day. I mean, I didn't get a chance to change into my Halloween costume. Big deal. Yeah. But I was there for the kids. So you just, you figure it out. You can do it all. I actually think as a mother, mm -hmm. as a working mother, mm -hmm. there is some discipline that comes with that. Mm -hmm. There is just some, um, uh, just something in the heart that you bring home and you bring to work. It just all blends together. It's who you are. I think any workplace that has working mothers in it, they have something special. I mean, and, and fathers too. When you have kids and you're bringing all that together, like I'm big on the kids. I'm about to get, I just told somebody yesterday, I want a whole kid wall. And, and, and I'm also sensitive to the fact that some people don't have kids. Right. Because I was in that space for a long time. I couldn't even watch people have baby showers. I couldn't watch people have babies. So, so I'm sensitive to that, too. Right. So you just try to create a workplace where you are just celebrating everybody, including working parents. Absolutely. You get it all done. Because it's it is so much too is about what you're modeling. Yes, for your kids too. Yes. Uh, with the whole uh, COVID situation and Zoom and all that, and people sometimes you would hear somebody saying, you know, trying to move their kids away, and my work team will tell you. I said, hey, did we hear a little one? I said, who is that? I said, put them on the screen. Yeah. And so we know everybody's kids. I mean, I'm on the calls right now, and you'll hear somebody say, is that sent? I said, bring the little honey to the phone. <laughs> Because it shouldn't be a mystery. Like, I love bring your kids to work day, right? It shouldn't be a mystery. Yeah. All of this kind of just like blends. This is this is our life. Mm -hmm. And we just have different aspects of our life, but it's one life. Yep. And you don't have to balance one life. It is your one life. Mm -hmm. And it's just different aspects of it, and you do what you need to do to live it. What a great legacy um, that you have had already as you look ahead to the next few years the next five years. Yes. You said you ask people that. Yes, I what, do. Where do you want to be in five I do. years? I, do. I want to know where you want to be in five years. Well, let's see. I want to have a championship uh, with the Mavs. <laughs> okay. Because we already have one in 2011. So yeah. I, I want to be a part of one. And yeah. so that'll, that'll happen soon. We have some great players and great yeah. coaches. Uh, and then what I call my next phase is books, boards, and better. Hmm. Uh, that I'll write more books probably about Yay. leadership and, and I want to write one about motherhood and my path to motherhood and all that. Um, probably won't write one about like my corporate stuff. Cause that's just, mm -hmm. I mean, it's beautiful as work. Um, but I want to write one about motherhood and about leadership. Yeah. Um, and so, and my mom and all that. So anyway, so books and then boards, I sit on nonprofit boards and corporate boards. And so I find that valuable because I actually have something to offer mm -hmm. uh, and boards are just trying to change cultures and all that. And so I get to contribute to some of that. Um, so that's fun. Just being kind of in that space where I actually have 
the knowledge and experience to contribute to a corporate board. Because growing up in a corporation, you see the board members, and it's like, ooh, what's going on in the boardroom? <laughs> and now I know what's going on in the boardroom. We're just trying to make the company better for the employees and the share owners. Uh, so that's fun, because that's actually my world. Yeah. The corporate space is where I grew up in. Uh, and then just making things better. Uh, so that's where my nonprofit boards come in and all that. I have a passion for education, a passion uh, for permanence and stability for our kids. And so every day I'm just trying to think, how can I partner with other people? Because you, you do nothing by yourself, right? right? How can I partner with other people so we could just make the world better? And then when things happen, crazy things in the world, you know, is this an opportunity, you know, to use our platform, our resources and all that to make something better every day? Reading your book and seeing just your perspective on going through the very challenging experience that you had with cancer and your upbringing and losing the children, that you have maintained this whole attitude of God chose you for all of this yes. to inspire and help others. And you're doing that. And I'm yes. glad there'll be more books yes. that will continue yes. to do that and Thank more you. boards that will gain from your uh, <laughs> benefit from your wisdom and experience oh, and, and just the joy that you exude. Oh, um, so thank, thank you. you. Oh, thank you for I appreciate sharing that you. with all of us. Thank You're you. A blessing for sure. Okay. Thanks. Ed. Uh, wow. That was amazing. That was powerful. She is delightful. Yeah. She is just a bundle of energy. Mm -hmm. So positive. Um, I really liked how she talked about just having an integrated life. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So especially for women who are in leadership or moms. Yeah. By like integrating all that together. Well, I think it goes for dads too. Yeah. Or, or really for anybody. Yeah. There is just no such thing as a balanced life. Yeah. That's you know, right. we just need to look at it differently and integrate all aspects yeah. of our life amazing. together. So it's good. I love it. Yeah. So should we talk about subscribing and things? Sure. Let's do that. Okay, so a few ways. That Please you, rate us. Well, yeah, we want you to rate five us. Five stars. We want you to give us five stars for this, right? And we also want you to subscribe because it's a way for you, if, if someone sent this to you and you listen to this for the first time, go ahead and click the sub subscribe button. It'll really help you stay in touch with everything that's happening in the Global Leadership Network world and the Global Leadership Summit world. And we got tons of stuff going on, so you're gonna wanna stay up to date. And keep leading where you are. And keep getting better.